Hi, I'm Sean Palmaville Size, Executive Director of the Motor Cities National Heritage Area. Under the auspices of the National Park Service, we are emboldened by Congress to tell the story of how the area of Southeast and Central Michigan put the world on wheels. We are committed to promoting a view of this story, this automotive and auto labor story that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive. To truly fulfill our mission, it is vital that we have a range of voices from different backgrounds, different cultures, different languages even, representing this story. After all, we share a remarkable automotive heritage, and we call this program Many Voices, One Story. Today's voice in the story is from Ms. Cindy Estrada, Vice President of the United Auto Workers International. Cindy is currently heading the Stellantis Department, formerly FCA, the Women's Department, the Independent Parts Suppliers, and Organizing. I think I got all of those in there. So, Cindy, it's a pleasure to meet you. We thank you for joining us today for the interview. Thank you for having me. Delighted you're here. So let's go and start at the beginning. Can you tell us about your family roots in Southwest Detroit and how they may have influenced your eventual path in life? Yeah, so I'm, um, you know, I come from a background of uh, my mother was Polish and um, my father is, is Mexican and um, they married at a time when I think uh, races didn't mix, um, but they, uh, my dad, um, probably what's most important in my background is, is my father was a bar owner in Southwest Detroit. Um, his brothers mostly all went to work for the auto plant. So most of my uncles are all either from GM and Ford. Um, but my dad took a different route. He wanted to own his own business and owned a number of them, a pizza place at one point. Um, he was a union member prior to owning a business at Risden Dairy, um, and, uh, but wanted to go off on his own. So my background is, is really just his neighborhood bar in the community where I had the opportunity to meet a wide range of people. It was a very diverse bar, um, mostly union members um, that came in there. And so it was very influential to see the community, the way that my dad interacted with them, um, to see how much plants, auto plants were important to his business. People came in there for lunches, they came in to cash their checks. Um, and what happened, what influenced me probably the most is what happened as plants started to close down and, um, and starting to see how, what happened in that community in terms of jobs impacted small business owners as well. And, um, and to watch that community, uh, you know, suffer in, in a very deep way and, and hear those stories and see those firsthand, um, I think influenced what I did later on in life. So then how did you get started with union organizing work? So again, the background, um, you know, having a, a Mexican father, I'd always grown up hearing about Cesar Chavez, um, you know, at one point, the UFW, United Farm Workers Office, had their boycott office right next door to my father's bar. So, you know, as a young child, you know, I remember that. I remember the discussions on it. We supported the grape boycott, the lettuce boycott. And um, so I always had this dream of, and my, my, my uncle was very prominent in LACWA, which is Labor Council for Latin America Affairs. He was a union member. It's a union um, group. And and I always wanted to have the experience of going to work for Cesar Chavez. Um, even when I knew that I wanted to go to school, I thought I wanted to be a teacher. Um, and I, I went to college, but I, I wanted to do an internship with them. And, and I did. I went out to California, work with Dolores Huerta, who is the co-founder of the UFW, which a lot of people don't know because you hear a lot about Cesar Chavez. Um, but as a woman labor leader, she helped co-found that union. And, and that just really changed my life. Um, you know, she, I had lots of discussions with her and one was around, you know, it's great to teach children, um, but, you know, how do we make sure that their parents have enough disposable income to support those children? And so it really changed where I wanted to go and the social justice that I wanted to fight for and, um, and came back to Michigan um, 
still going to go into teaching, but then had uh, was in a, a, a job just temporarily in a union shop when Mexican Industries was organizing, which was um, an auto parts plant, multiple auto parts plants in Southwest Detroit with mostly um, women workers, mostly Spanish speaking, a lot of undocumented. And someone had invited me to go to the meeting to help translate, just, just translate. And I never turned back. Um, when I heard the stories coming from these women, when um, I see what the union was trying to do in terms of trying to build democracy in the workplace and give them a voice. Um, and when I saw them standing up for their rights under very scary um, anti-union campaign, I just, I never looked back. I knew that's what I wanted to do. So that was how you got introduced to the UAW then? Yep, it was by helping on one of the campaigns. And then I was, the way it works in the UAW, um, you know, you can be pulled out as a temporary organizer. And so that's what I did. And I stayed in that role and never left. And I finally found a job where I could, um, it wasn't a job, it was a way of life, um, helping workers fight for social justice. Great. And then, so how did that translate or in inspire you to become in involved in leadership? You know, I really didn't necessarily intend to become involved in leadership. I really liked the job. I was happy doing the job that I was doing, um, uh, which is training others to be leaders, to stand up for themselves. Um, it's a great job. But then I, I got pregnant with twins and um, I knew that I needed to step away, that it wasn't, it wasn't as easy to live on the road and raise my children at the same time. So I, I started to um, work in training organizers that didn't put me in the field as much. And then just openings started happening um, where, you know, some other women left the union, there was an opportunity um, and, and people had kept talking to me about it. So it really was the encouragement of others. Um, particularly my husband. Uh, and, you know, um, it was encouragement of a lot of men and a lot of women uh, to get me to, to vision that. I didn't vision that. And, and I'm, glad I, I'm glad they did. And I'm glad I did because we need more women leaders. That's great. Yes. And it's great to hear you say that. So, Cindy, as a woman and a UAW vice president, what are some of the most notable evolutions from your point of view in the labor movement since you began? So in terms of women, um, one of the things that I've seen change is the number of women that are stepping into leadership. Um, it, for example, we just did a meeting with Vice President Harris um, with uh, labor leaders, women labor leaders, and there were seven of us in the room, many of them presidents, secretary, treasurers. That is definitely a shift when it comes to women in the labor movement. Um, I have also seen at a time when, um, you know, to me, structural sexism exists. And sometimes um, I've seen because of that, because there have been so few women at the table that women tend to think there's only space for one woman and a lot of competition. I, what I see today is more women supporting each other than I've ever seen before, not just in the pockets of our small friends in friend groups or, but in, in, a, in a larger way. Um, I see there's much more discussion about the need for women's voices at the table. Um, it does change um, conversations, right? Um, you know, different genders bring different perspectives. And so I've seen more of that happen. Um, and, you know, in terms of the labor movement in general, we've seen a, a big decline in unions. And because of that, we've seen a big decline in disposable income. Um, we've seen sort of a separation between uh, the, the middle class and the wealthy. Um, so some things that are not good, right? But you see a, a moment in this country where people are recognizing that, like this cannot continue to exist. Unions balance the power. And um, when we decline and, and we have less power at the table, then there's no one representing working people. Then you have income inequality. You have, you know, um, disparities in healthcare, you know, uh, so a lot of issues that are surfacing now in light of COVID, right? Pay time off, all the things we were not able to gain because we didn't have the power, you know, we need to figure out now because workers are suffering and women in particular, right? 42% of, um, of women in this country are the sole breadwinner. And, and, it, and it's even worth for women of color. Um, you know, it's even higher whether you're Asian, Latino, or, or a black woman. And so um, 
we, I, I, I see now a coming together of a number of groups that are ready to work all together to change that. No one can do it alone. It needs to be like-minded groups working together. So it sounds like you're speaking of perhaps a lot of the work that you do for the women's department in the UAW. Do you have specific goals in that department that you can share with us? You know, I think it goes back to not just women, like goals um, in the women's department is engage the women in organizing, which is another department I have. Um, You know, right now, as there's 14 um, car companies in the United States, and only three of them are organized, Ford, GM, and Stellantis, formerly FCA and Chrysler. Um, And that means that we're not setting the standard anymore in in terms of manufacturing wages as like we used to. And that means that a lot of other companies are paying a lot less, a lot less benefits. Um, And so it's engaging women, the whole union, and how do we organize and um, help workers have a chance to have collective bargaining. That's really what's going to change things. I mean, um, I also have the independent part suppliers department where, you know, a lot of people think manufacturing is going to rebuild the middle class. That is only true if unions are, if those workers have a union, because the truth is, Manufacturing in this country, absent a union, are often $10, $11, $12 an hour jobs. Um, So you have 700,000 part supplier workers that are building parts for for a car company working, and many of them working at poverty level wages. They're literally working full time, walking into a food stamp line, um, and then being vilified for having to do that while corporations are making billions of dollars. So to me, it's the it's it's the job of the women's department, the whole entire union. How do we reach out to other workers and help them form a union? You shouldn't have to punch out of democracy when you punch into your plant or wherever you work. That's very profound. Um, as a Latina, do you view your role as vice president as an opportunity for representation of the Latinx community in the industry? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, just the fact that when other kids can see themselves, um, they know that it's possible, right? Um, and so, you know, the Latino is a, the one of the fastest growing groups, and there's a lot of discrimination, um, you know. And so, yes, I feel I feel a huge responsibility. I'm the first Latina to sit as an officer in the UAW, and and I did not get here before many, many others. Maybe they didn't make it as high as me, but they paved the way. Um, and uh, so I feel a huge responsibility and representation and, and I'm very involved in whether it's immigrant rights issues um, or you know, being available when, when there's opportunities to speak to other um, Latinos about the importance of the labor movement, the importance of leadership and the importance of our voice needing to be at the table. Mm-hmm. So out of all of your accomplishments, both in the labor movement and in the community, what are you most proud of? I think I'm most proud of, well, besides the community, I'm most proud of um, being a woman raising two teenage boys as a widow and being able to do it. Um, it's, it's a constant balance. I think I'm modeling for my children that um, you can suffer uh you know, things in your life and you could still move forward and turn those into positive things. So I think I I modeled that for other, you know, members that know me too. It's like, um, you know, it's possible. It's painful sometimes, but it's possible. But I think the most proud is balancing, um, having that discussion about, it's not just about the membership of the UAW, that's my priority, but in order to really live the mission of our union, it's also about making sure that when we negotiate, we're also um, talking about the community, right? Um, how we can be involved in issues, whether it's around housing or water that impact the broader community and getting our members involved in those kinds of issues so that you're not just thinking about me and my membership, but the larger community is really um, what our union is about, whether it was a civil rights movement, you know, um, whether it was, uh, you know, you know, poor people's campaign. Um, and so I think I'm most proud of that, of constantly putting that discussion at the table, that it's about our members, but it's also about other issues, social justice issues and how we can impact them and our responsibility um, to help with that. 
So that leads us into our, our final question. As you look toward the future, what advice would you give to someone looking to become active in the labor movement? You know, one is to, um, you know, to reach out, you know, in, if they have a union, right, is to, to reach out and get involved in that union. A union's only as strong as the workers who are active and involved in it. It's not me, right? Um, it really is what those workers on the shop floor or a facility they work in, how much they're involved. And so my advice is to get involved in your union. If you're not involved in a union, there's so many things happening in the country today that you can impact and organize around. You know, just again, going back to COVID and what it's exposed, we need organizing activism around paid time off for workers period, not just women workers. We need activism around a fair system of healthcare, health, you know, Medicare for all. We need activism around what's happening to water in this country and access and human rights. Um, so there's a number of issues that if you just sort of dig a little deeper into what's happening in your community, you can find a group to get plugged into. Um, and so I would just really encourage to start attending some of those meetings and, and listen to see, you know, what moves you and, and, and to work to make those things happen. Great advice. Well, thank you so much, Cindy, for adding your voice to our many voices, a one story project. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. <laughs>